Hi everyone, I'm Luke Hector and you're watching The Broken Meeple. This is a YouTube channel about board games where I give reviews, top tens and my honest opinions regardless of the consequences. We'll get on with the show in just a minute but first a quick word from my sponsor. As a fellow gamer, you'll understand this is unacceptable. The solution? Head down to my new sponsor, Kiender.co.uk. Kiender stocks many of the hot new releases as well as some old hidden gems. Free delivery on orders over £30, further discounts on bulk purchases, and even 5% of your spending refunded back to you as points to be used for further discounts down the line. If you use the referral link in the description below and sign up for a new account, you'll get 5% discount on your first order over £60. So let's make gaps in your collection a thing of the past. Get down to Kiender and start saving today. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the video. Get on with it. So on this review, which is slightly different from the normal format, thanks for the feedback on that by the way everybody, this is Everdale Farshore, a review copy from Kiender, and this one has got my attention mainly because of the buzz that has surrounded it. Because Everdale is a game as a background I'm okay with. I don't mind it, but I don't think it's amazing. I'd give it a 6, 7 out of 10 tops. I've only played it with Pearlbrook expansion, and I thought that expansion actually made the game worse. So I would like to try it maybe with Spirecrest, but it just looks like it's too bloated at the moment. The game itself is fine, but it wasn't really anything that I massively got into, apart from the fact that I thought it was pretty, and it had one of the dumbest components it had you know, in most games, that giant tree, although... We might be able to give that tree a run for its money, more on that later, but yeah, I wasn't exactly a massive fan. So with this new version, I was kind of thinking, well, is it too similar to the original game? In which case, do you need to own both? And given a certain um, cost implication that we'll be ranting about a bit later on, is it even worth purchasing for what you are getting in this game? Well, that's what I'm here for. Let's get on with it. So very briefly, if you have played Everdale, you've pretty much played 95% of this game. Everdale Farshore is essentially the same thing with a few tweaks. You still go through the same premise of the game where you have the worker animals and you go on different spaces on the board to collect these different resources for the primary purpose of playing cards from the bay or from your hand. And basically these cards are all gorgeous artwork with various costs and points requirement. Some of them will produce resources at different types of the game, some are buildings, some are critters, some give you more worker spaces, you know, they basically do a myriad of things much in the same way as Everdale, but you have to get the resources to play them and it's kind of like an engine tableau building game. You only have a select amount of workers and during the game you'll have to decide, right, I need to move on to the next season from spring to summer to autumn, etc. As you go from season to season, you'll be able to get more workers and be able to do more stuff on future rounds, but of course people can do that at different times, so you're trying to be as efficient as you can before you progress to the next season. Once everybody's gone through the three seasons, you essentially look at your entire tableau of cards as well as where you are on the points track, total it all up, and of course, the one with the most. Of course! So in terms of similar games, well, the original Everdale for a kickoff, I mean, that's kind of what it is really. <laughs> the whole game is basically Everdale 1.25, more on that later. But for other tableau games that are similar, you could consider something like Empires of the North on the shelf behind me from Portal Games. This one is the same sort of deal. You, instead of having a common deck of cards though, you essentially have your own deck, but it's still a case of play the cards in front of you, use them to get resources, use those resources to get victory points in some respect, or play more cards, and the idea is be efficient and get the most points at the end. So a similar deal, and to be fair, a lot of other tableau builders can give you that same sense of, right, I need to get a bunch of cards out in front of me utilizing resources. But Empires of the North I think is kind of one of the closer bets other than obviously the original Everdale in terms of the fact that this one relies heavily on getting the resources for the cards. It's not just a byproduct, it's kind of the, the main focus of the game. So production quality is the first pro for the most part. There are some blemishes and I'll get onto those a bit later, but the good side of the production, we've got lots of squishy little mushrooms, some good gemstones, very thick wooden pieces, metal anchors, you know, but, and some really cool solid elements there. But the main thing I love is the artwork in this game. This artwork is beautiful and gorgeous. So colorful, so vibrant. Yes, there's duplicate cards in here, but everything just looks great on the table when you've got 15 of these cards looking this good. The artist deserves to get used in other games because this is just beautiful. None of that AI garbage. This is why you get proper people to do art. It really is gorgeous and looks nice on the table with some blemishes. More on that a bit later. Ooh, you good looking. You're hot. 
The game itself is not particularly hard to play either. It's not a huge rule book. And if you've played Everdell, as I said, you pretty much played 95% of this game because it's basically Everdell 1.25. The exact same rules from Everdell are basically in here with a few little tweaks which are pretty much summarized on the back of this book. And to be honest, the tweaks are what I would consider to be an improvement over the original Everdell, but they're not substantial changes. And some of these you can even house roll into the original one. Those eight cards in the bay that you thought, oh, we got loads of duplicates there. Well, here it tells you to stack them. Well, great, we can house roll that into the normal game. I don't need to buy this for that. Okay, so what else have you changed? Well, you now can play certain cards by using anchors, basically, to negate the cost, as long as you've got a matching card in your display. That's cool. It's easier than having to search through the entire deck trying to find the uh, the wife when you've got the husband or the, the green building when you've got the green critter and stuff. It's like, this one is just a nice case of, look, do you have the matching color? Fine. Spend an anchor. Done. And you can do it three times in the game. It's nice. It's flexible. And I enjoy it. The events that you had before are basically these map tiles. This is kind of generic. It's just a way of streamlining the game. All it is is that you can go to a space and claim map tiles if you have three or certain numbers of the symbols on the cards. That's basically it. It's just set collection of the symbols. Go grab a map tile and you'll get points for it. It's certainly less fiddly than dealing with events, but whatever, I can take or leave either one. Really, the main sort of change that I quite like is these wind tiles. I think they're called wind rose tiles. These basically, and there's more than four of them, I've just got a few out here, but basically you flip a couple of them over and they have like pre they have like symbols from the cards or other types of things on them, like other requirements. And the idea is, is when these are face up, if you play a card that matches one of the tiles, you get to move your ship, where do I put it, around the edge of the board and it scores more points as you go around. Around. Well, other than that, blem you know, the, it gets a little bit hard to see where your ship is in relation to the points. That's a bit annoying. But I like this idea that it's not just simply play cards from the display that you fancy. There's also a tactical element to, well, you know, if I play one of them with the green symbol this time, I can, you know, I can move across there. Do I want to play the green card though? Because I was really hoping to play this blue one. But you know what? The green does get me the ship movement and it just gives you a nice cool choice to decide whether you're going to aim for that or not. Do it, do it, do it, do it. The solo mode in this game is also pretty straightforward to play. You basically have a Bonnie the Crab or whatever it is and you play essentially the exact same game you've been playing already but all this character does is basically flips over a card which dictates what action spaces he'll try to clog up and once he's used all his workers he'll then try to play cards and he's got this kind of slightly fiddly but not too complicated method of selecting which cards he will do based on these like re like these tracker markers for the different symbols so you can kind of almost strategically think well hang on a minute at this rate he's likely to go nick a gr uh, purple card well, I really wanted that purple card there, but if he hasn't got one in his hand, he's going to play a purple card from the bay and I'm going to lose it. So do I grab the purple card early or do I just say, you know what, forget it, let him have it, focus on something else, especially when I know he's not going to, for example, grab a blue card anytime soon. It's a nice little tactical element, but other than that, the solo mode is just pretty straightforward and simple. There's not really a lot of extra rules. You can tweak the difficulty, make it a bit harder, but... Honestly, if you found that the multiplayer game was a bit too long, then the solo mode is a quick and easy way for you to get the same feel of multiplayer, essentially, but in a much shorter playtime. This is why Superman works alone. Now, I mentioned negative production aspects, and there are some elements I don't like. The seaweed I find to be really sort of annoying, chintzy, and whatever. You know, the, the white plastic clamshells are nice, but they are, again, kind of a little bit on the thin side. You know, they're not particularly sturdy. And the insert is not exactly quite stellar, really. I mean, it's got like cubby holes that are shaped like some of the resources, but they're not designed for that specific resource. You're meant to just put stuff in there. Most of the time, you're going to put everything in the baggies because otherwise it's going to be all over the shop. The map tiles, you kind of have to squeeze in the middle, like cubby hole there. Uh, really, the only thing that works well is storage of the four boats, which is really inefficient. You know, it's using up a lot of space in the, board, in the box just to store four ships. I mean, it can't be that hard. And the cards. But let's face it, if you mess up storing a card trade and you're doing something wrong. So the insert kind of feels like one of those, uh, we put in a token map effort, but we didn't really bother. But here's where things get really bad. And I'm sorry, I'm going to rant on this because this is atrocious. Uh, I went on a bit of a rant in my uh, last podcast episode about value for money. Now, this game is designed in every way to not be value for money. In fact, this has the makings, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use the term, of a lazy cash grab. Ah, cash grab! Because first of all, this is Everdell 1.25. It's literally Everdell with some small tweaks. That's it. 
There's no reason to own both. I can't imagine why you would. Pick one of the two and go with it. But on top of that, the MRS MRSP, the RRP of this game is £100. <laughs> oh, wait, you're serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> that is insane. That is ridiculous. I mean, for crying out loud, Marvel Dagger I said was expensive when I reviewed that, and yet you can still buy that for about £70, right? This, the cheapest price I see this online is about £85. £85 for a card game with some nice looking resources. But that's kind of it. But look, it looks really gorgeous on the artwork. Yet, yeah, so does a lot of other games I have. They have good artwork. Ever heard of a small card game called Canopy? It doesn't cost £100, but it's got some of the best artwork I've seen from Vincent Dutre. You know, it's not that much of a price hike to get artwork. So the components, well, I mean, wooden pieces. Yes, they're nice mushrooms and nice little gemstones. Metal anchors, it's a waste to make them metal. They could have just been cardboard, it would have been fine. But... There's not enough stuff in here, even though there is good production in some respects, to justify a hundred pounds. I mean, hundred pounds, you're talking like Forbidden Stars and like Star Wars Rebellion and God knows what else. You know, these games don't even cost as much as this one does. And yet the amount of content in miniatures you get in those dwarfs what you're going to get in here. I mean, what did they do? Spend 50 pounds on this stupid lighthouse? And oh my God, you thought the tree was bad. This is a complete waste of space. It really is. It's just basically... Four cardboard pieces shoved together with two rings on it. It sits on the top of the board and does even less than the tree did in Everdell. I don't even know how that's possible to do. This thing just stays there and all you do is put your workers on it and chain and get them at the season. That's it. Whippy. Other than that, it sits there blocking line of sight for one poor person on the wrong side of it. And even then, the bits where you've got to fit the workers aren't even big enough to fit the workers. I struggled to get two players worth of workers on this thing. One little nudge and whoop, there we go, we got a casualty. Oh, one nudge, I've lost another one. You try getting four players worth of workers on this thing. It's ridiculous. This serves literally no purpose. I'm literally just chucking it around because there's no point to that tree. If that is why your game cost a lot, then seriously. I award you no points and may God have mercy on your soul. The game also scales from two to four players, but it does still, like Everdell, take too long with more players. This is really a game that I would mainly just play solo, maybe two players, you know, one on one. Three player can work, but there's no real reason to add more players. They don't do anything, they just clog up more spaces, and that's kind of it really. Four players, what's the point? It just elongates the game and you just, you've got too much downtime before your turn. But the solo mode is pretty much identical to multiplayer, for like 90% the same as multiplayer, so you might as well just play this solo, and I can think of cheaper solo games I can get for a kickoff. But yeah, for four players, I just don't see any particular reason why I would. It's too long. And as much as they have trimmed some of the fat in order to make it a more streamlined experience, you do lose maybe just a little bit of that good meat from the original Everdell. I still think that this is probably the better of the two games, but when you trim it to this extent, apart from these Windrose tiles, which I do quite like, the rest of it is fairly generic. I mean, you have a few spaces to get the resources. You have one to get some cards, and you have one to discard some cards. That's pretty much what it is for the locations. You have a couple of like different ones in each game that you can use depending on players, but even these aren't that amazing. They're just different combinations of get resources and cards for the most part. You know, it's not like the game's going to be drastically different just because there's a couple of these out that aren't anywhere else. Although I do like the idea that these cover up in the later phase, so you kind of have to use other, uh, like other places. That's quite cool. They call it high tide. That's quite neat. But, you know, these map tiles, it's just basically set collection. You know, the only real meat of this is what you can do with these cards, which is in normal Everdell. So this one kind of feels, it feels smoother, and it's certainly, I suppose, easier to get to the table, but you can tell that this feels like a stripped down version of the original. Everdell Farshore is a solid enough game. If you like Everdell, you're gonna like this. There's, there's, there's no question about it. I can't see why you would hate one and not the other. 
but there is zero reason to own both. No, no reason at all. The, the changes are too minor to justify why this is its own big game with its own box and own price tag. You can house rule half of the changes in this in normal Everdale, so you're only really left with a couple of other changes, and even then, are you going to like them as much? I don't know. You know, really, the main change that I'm a massive fan on are these Windrose tiles. The rest of it, yeah, I mean, cards not stacking in the bay and stuff. Again, you can house rule that into Everdale, so that's not even really worth considering as a change but I just can't get past that price point. They could have trimmed some fat here. I mean we didn't need metal anchors. We didn't need this ridiculous lighthouse, you know, this poor place lighthouse. But then even with that price tag you've still got to suffer with this weird seaweed. You've got to suffer with this insert that's not particularly, you know, not particularly great. It it just has a few aspects that make you question why? Why is it like that? Despite the fact that the game is fairly smooth, fairly enjoyable, but again, not really suited to mass multiplayer. It's really a solo two-player game, and that's about it. For that price tag, I just don't see it happening. So Everdale Fireshore for me is getting a 6 out of 10 overall. I still think there's a solid game here. I like the card play. The card play is the real meat of Everdale, and this bit is still fun. And the solo mode, again, nice and quick, and you can get most of the multiplayer feel with the solo mode. And some of the production is great, you know, it certainly does look beautiful, but it still definitely feels like a trimmed down version of the other one, despite some cool changes that they've made, to the point where it feels maybe just a little bit too simple in the in the in what you're doing in the game, despite the fact that there's still like a lot of weird abilities on some of these cards. It's easy to teach. Great, I do really like that. If you don't care about money and it's just coming out of your ears or whatever, then fine, go buy this game and you'll probably have a good time because I still think overall I would rather play this version over normal Everdale, unless you threw in some of the expansions. That's the other factor. Do you want to expand Everdale? Well, then you gotta get the original Everdale because Lord knows if this is gonna get expansions and if it does, how long is it gonna be before it does and will it get too bloated as a result? And also, you've already spent a hundred pound nearly on the game, so what, you wanna spend another hundred quid getting expansions? I don't think so. <laughs> Not gonna happen with me. So, six out of 10. It's above average, it's enjoyable, but there's a couple of those aspects that just make you question why. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, then please thumb it up on YouTube and thumb it up on Board Game Geek when it goes live on the site. Don't forget to check out more content on the channel, including the recent review I did for Lost Ruins of Arnak, the expansion. Let me know your thoughts on this slightly tweaked review format. It goes over the pros and cons of the review, but tries to quicken through the initial setup of background and overview and that so I can get stuck into the review and keep my fun intro that I really like. So take care, and remember, regardless of what you're going to use this crazy lighthouse piece for, it's still only a game. So really watch your wallets and consider how much money you have. And remember, it's still only a game. Bye for now, everyone.